Okay, so we're streaming to YouTube, and it will probably annoy me here in a minute. Okay, so we're streaming to YouTube, and it will probably annoy me. There we go. I love talking in circles. I hear it on somebody else's, I think. Should I go ahead and play it too? <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> no. turn the volume way down. Look at that beautiful mirror. Yeah, not bad for a first selfie. Uh, Tony, I think we're live on YouTube. I, I heard somebody else uh, spooling it there, so uh, it looks I like it's it. I yeah, it's on. I got it, too. Oh, okay. Okay, we've got a few in the green room here. Put the minutes back up for a little bit. Yeah. Terry had your pictures up for a minute, Jamie. Uh, I notice my niece in York, England has already marked them with a like. I was wondering who that was. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Jill Sager. Looks like you had great skies for it. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Okay. We're about a minute uh, past the hour here. Uh, and uh, Jamie and uh, uh, Joyce, we all kind of watch the uh, participants list. If somebody shows up, please let them in. I'm going to worry about some other stuff. So uh, we'll uh, move the agenda over. <clears throat> and it's very simple this month. Uh, so we always start off by uh, welcoming new members, visitors, and guests. And if anybody uh, in the audience is under that category and would like to uh, say hi to us, would, uh, would like to know uh, who you are and welcome you. So do we have anybody here for the first time? Siddhartha? Yes. Hi, I'm Sid Chatterjee. Uh, I'm a professor at UT and um, I've been doing a little bit of backyard uh, astronomy over the past two years for obvious reasons. And then I was looking around to see what was available here and I found you all, so I joined up. Okay. Welcome. Looking forward to it. Thank you, sir. Glad to have you here. Uh, so uh, we've been kind of operating on a restricted basis for the whole COVID uh, situation and we hope to bust out of that pretty soon. Uh, and maybe sometime in the spring semester, we'll uh, be able to hold meetings back on the UT campus. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. But uh, great to have you with us. Anybody else here for the first time? Okay, then. Uh, so... Next task is uh, to approve our minutes here. And there weren't a lot of minutes from the January meeting, but I'll leave this up for another couple of minutes and uh, then we'll uh, uh, see if there's any uh, questions or concerns. And here's Chris Bernhardt and James. Oh, got it. Okay. 
Okay, anybody have any question about the minutes or concerns or want to be an editor or? <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, then we'll consider the, the minutes uh, approved uh, for this month and move on. <clears throat> and we'll go straight into our officer's reports. Uh, so we are still operating without a vice president. Uh, the vice president is the uh, primary person involved with uh, setting up our speakers every month, uh, also on our meeting venues. And uh, uh, we, uh, <laughs> we sorely miss that, uh, uh, that uh, role when uh, we don't have a, a capable person in it. So uh, we're gonna talk about elections later on and uh, well, this is a particular one we'd like to get filled in our next session. Uh, as far as the meetings go, uh, we uh, have lined up uh, most of the spring uh, uh, sessions here. Uh, we're gonna be talking to one or two or more rocket companies and uh, Chris Bernhardt has, has been working with a couple of those and uh, trying to seal so a deal here. Chris, can you give us the latest on what's going on? Hey, Terry, I can. Yeah, it looks like uh, we are confirmed with first uh, Cesium Astro. Uh, and these are both Austin-based uh, rocket companies and uh, different things. Uh, Cesium does various kind of communications and satellites. And, you know, I think um, we're, we're trying to find uh, – Topics that are of, of astronomical space interests. Also, you know, keep an eye on, uh, they're keeping an eye definitely on kind of the IP that's being shared. But uh, we are uh, working through outlines now. Uh, I promised them a, a group of inquisitive uh, individuals that will, will ask lots of good questions. But uh, I think Cessian was thinking about different kinds of maybe low Earth um, orbit kinds of, of uh, you know, physics and dynamics and things they have to consider about putting uh, different communications devices. Uh, so if you're curious, go sesiumastro.com, um, which uh, we're, we're really excited about. And then uh, we have a, a second company as well that we are also looking um, to, um, uh, to, to have meet a little bit later on. And um, one second here. Um, one second, got to find them. So, Chris, did we finalize a date with Cessium? Uh, I believe we are May thirteenth for Cessium. Okay. And then the in the other company, uh, we're not quite finalized. Terry and I are having coffee uh, with one of the company representatives on Monday, so we'll we'll make the announcement for finalized. Uh, but that should be a good conversation, and they do uh, different kinds of. Uh, big data uh, and uh, training and simulations, really, I think, trying to create an infrastructure for space travel, uh, which would be interesting. So um, I think it'll be a couple of different topics than what we've had the past few years, uh, but uh, it might be uh, interesting to see who is uh, really energized wow. by the speakers. So more to come. Okay. Well, that, we have... Is that something spelled like the element, uh, C-E-S-I-U-M? I thought it was cesium, but maybe it's... Just way to pronounce it. Sorry, liberal arts person. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, we have a lot of members, uh, a few members that are fanatic about studying satellites, and then everybody's got a general interest, especially our astrophotographers. If you see the screen here, uh, you can see it was a busy satellite night uh, earlier this week uh, uh, when uh, – well, SpaceX's Skylink company uh, put up 49 satellites and uh, 40 of them promptly came back down. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, Cesium works in that area. I'm sure we can find some things we'd like to, to, uh, to discuss with them. Uh, so one other person we want to get this, this spring is Don Olson, uh, who uh, requires uh, an in-person meeting. He won't do a Zoom or anything that's recorded. Uh, he's uh, a long time, he's been presenting to AAS almost yearly for decades. And uh, I guess the best title for him is he's a forensic astronomer, uh, uh, always has great talks about uh, things that happened in history, famous things that happened in history that have an astronomical uh, slant to them and how you can nail things down by getting your uh, astronomy right. Uh, so it's possible we'll get him in on the April slot. 
which would leave March open right uh, now. Well, you said April for, for uh, the other company, then we might, I'm not sure we can get Don in, uh, in uh, February, uh, March, but we'll try. Uh, anyway, uh, anybody else have ideas for speakers? Let us know and we'll extend our, our, uh, our calendar out there to uh, summertime. Okay. All right. Uh, okay. Uh, did Patrick uh, make it tonight? Patrick's our treasurer. Don't see him on the list. Okay. Uh, I know a couple of things uh, uh, that went through the treasurers uh, in the past month. Uh, we did get a, uh, a check uh, from uh, the El Dorado Star Party. Uh, we are a sponsor of that party and, a, and, a, and a, well, we, uh, we help put it on. Uh, they do make a, a profit and uh, they feed that back to uh, their sponsor clubs. Uh, usually we donate it right back to them. Uh, this year it was a uh, $861. And, uh, we're, we're kind of, <laughs> we've been talking about starting a capital campaign to raise some money and, and also ways to cut expenses this year. So I, I think we're going to hold on to it this year, uh, and, uh, see what we'll do next year. Um, we did get paid for, uh, the, uh, um, fundraiser we had with the, uh, the astronomy jackets in the, in the store. Uh, so uh, first batch of those uh, people that have got them are, are really liking them. Uh, I don't know if Sean's on, uh, but uh, we might ask about, are we going to repeat? We've had questions about whether we're going to repeat that offering. Uh, so uh, we'll talk about that maybe in a minute. Uh, that's really all I've got from the treasurer, uh, the treasurer side. We did file our, uh, 501c federal thing uh, in January. So we're up to date on that. Uh, paid our insurance in January as well. Okay, uh, we'll go on to outreach and Joyce. Well, unfortunately we've had to uh, cancel a whole lot of uh, events lately because of the weather, but we finally had one last night. Uh, there were Paul Urban, Tom Campbell, Jamie Canfield, and my husband Jim and I were at Dessau Elementary School in Pflugerville. It was a fantastic night for observing. Unfortunately, school programs, they kind of started early and ended early. So we were, we were finished out. Here's some, some pictures that Jamie took. We were finished by about uh, seven o'clock, but still we had, I don't know, a couple hundred people, I would say probably there. And wow. uh, they were excited to see the moon and, and the sun before it went down. And then Jupiter, as it finally came out, Tom found it before we could even see it. And then we, we're able to see it and the, the view through the telescope got better. So we at least have done something in the way of outreach and uh, hope to do more. The uh, next star party, at, uh, public star party is at Pedernales Falls on uh, March the 9th or February the 19th, which is a week from tomorrow. And we'll just keep our fingers crossed that the, the weather is like it was the last few days, not the way it's apparently going to be tomorrow, but uh, hopefully we'll. Uh, We'll have some good weather for uh, the, the 19th at Pedernales Falls. So while I have the floor, I'm going to put in a little plug for uh, something that you've been seeing in the newsletter and in emails, and that is the, uh, the signal texting group that we have established. Uh, just a way for people to chat with each other, sort of uh, those of you who've been around for a while, remember when we used to have the Yahoo groups and, and we would talk about anything and everything on the Yahoo groups. Well, the, uh, the modern version of that is, is a texting app. And the last I checked, we had 54 members in that. Uh, if you'll look in the newsletter that Nathan sent out today, it gives you the instructions about how to do it. And we would love to have uh, even more people participate in that. And that's it. Okay, thanks. A question, was that an eight inch uh, uh, I saw over there, an eight inch Dobsonian? that you had over there at the for party? yesterday's event? Yes. Yes. Yeah, I think that's what Jamie Jim, had. Jim, yeah. Jamie had the 8-inch. I had the 10-inch. <clears throat> okay. I have the yeah. club's 8-inch telescope. Okay. Oh, all right. I, I've got an 8-inch uh, for, if that matters. I, I, I saw the in invite. I was just not able to make it yesterday. Well, that that's fine. There will be 
lots of other. I'm sure there will be other opportunities. Yes, yes ma'am. Definitely. <laughs> so Jamie, was that a handheld uh, with your cell phone shot of the moon? <laughs> yes. All I did was just hold the phone up, you know, the little, little camera up to the eyepiece. And that's, uh, a, that's a pretty amazing shot for hand holding it. Hand holding I, your I was surprised. That's, that's, Nice and sharp. Good work, Jamie. Thank you. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so communications is shot. Did Sean Leary make it in? Okay. Uh, I'm not sure if I can cover much about what has gone on with communications other than uh, we recently uh, switched our payment processor. Um, if you uh, try to join the club or renew your membership or make a donation to AES, uh, you go to the website and uh, we had a payment processor there that had uh, basically an option for credit cards or PayPal. And uh, we've discontinued PayPal mostly because uh, uh, Wild Apricot, uh, who support, you know, who's, uh, the backbone behind all of our website here uh, will give us a, a break on our uh, yearly fee if we use their payment processor. And uh, I think it's called a FinaPay. And so we turned that on and actually it just makes it very transparent. Uh, you can use your credit card and go pay with a FinaPay and not even realize you're using another service there. Uh, so there's no jumping out to a third party uh, to get things lined up. Uh, so uh, we, we kind of had a couple of glitches in there, but I think it's working fine now. Uh, so if you've been trying to make a donation or renew and you have a problem, let us know and uh, we'll get it uh, straightened out as quickly as we can. But I think we got the, the glitches out of there. Okay. Uh, so uh, Greg, you want to update us on equipment? I saw Greg just sat down. <laughs> hey, Greg, we're waiting on you. Sorry, you caught me in the kitchen. Okay, so uh, not a whole lot of change in the equipment side of things here this month. Um, We've got some uh, little bit of work going on out at Paternalis uh, still. Um, the, uh, the pathway project to go out to the Henge is making some progress now. The, uh, the pathway has been, has been dug out, uh, but the, um, the park did not have the, the filter cloth to, put, to, to lay down into it uh, until, well, supposedly arrived yesterday. So that'll be done uh, over this weekend or over this next week. And uh, hopefully we'll have our, uh, have a work party out there uh, next week, just prior, you know, in the afternoon prior to the star party where we'll, uh, we'll uh, rake and smooth out that gravel and we'll use a, uh, a stomping foot to, uh, to pack it all down, uh, which, the, which the park already has. Um, that, and I think we've, uh, we've, we've received one, one donation, which, uh, Domingo just picked up, uh, yesterday, I think it was, um, for, uh, a, a small, uh, uh, refractor telescope. Um, that's, I think that's the only donation we've had in this last month. Um, uh, one other thing, uh, on a kind of equipment related I wanted to, uh, to mention um, for, for those of us who, uh, who do uh, go out to like uh, Texas star party or, or El Dorado or any of the others um, recently picked up a, uh, a really nice old uh, gizmo on, uh, on uh, Amazon. Um, let me see if you can see this or not. Uh, this is a, uh, this is a, a, five volt blender you charge with a usb cord <laughs> right. um, and it uh works really nicely and uh 
you can basically uh, you take one of these things to the star party. You can uh, uh, let's see. Here's the yeah. Here's the there's the box. It's called Blend Jet, uh, and uh, you can uh, make your own smoothies right on the spot. Uh, my uh, my daughter has been testing that out extensively, and she assures me that it works really really well. <laughs> So I just thought I'd mention that to uh, as a as a item of interest to anybody who uh, uh, likes to have likes to bring along a camp kitchen when you go to a star party. That's a that's a great addition for it. All right. Greg. So uh, the uh, the pathway party, you think, is going to be next Saturday uh, and we would that's do that before the star party. Yes, that's that's what I've been told by John Elvis, the okay. park superintendent. Do you have enough people lined up now or do you need a I think I've got like six people who have said that they'd be happy to help. Okay. Well, like I said, I'll probably be out there as well. So yep. okay, thanks, Greg. Uh okay, we don't have member services chair right now. Um, but uh, we have a few things to talk about in member services. So uh Chris has been working on an astronomy 101 program. So once we get back uh, to meeting in person, uh, we want to have a, a series of uh, uh, lectures and hands-on experience uh, for new members on very basic stuff about uh, how to use equipment and how the sky works and everything. Uh, Chris, you want to talk about that for a minute? Hi, Terry. Thank you. Uh, so this... Uh... Uh, one of the names in the back of my mind was almost like an unboxing party. I mean, this is Astronomy 101. Uh, <laughs> if you are new, if you know someone, you know, you got the scope at Christmas or the holidays, and uh, you're not sure where to start, which way is north, uh, this is the uh, event for you. It's going to be where, where the, the EC has been working with me. We have kind of a two uh, meeting situation uh, set up where there'd be, uh, we'd meet first either virtually or in person. Really go through basic sky movement, finding north in the sky, star charts, constellations, distances, uh, angles, distance, star hopping. I mean, just like your fundamental uh, um, orientations to the night sky. And then we would meet in the April uh, public star party at Pernan Alice. And so we'd get there early and uh, you say around two o'clock after lunch and really kind of, again, review a few basic concepts, uh, but also set our scopes up together. Uh, there'd be a good group, but, you know, we'll have like a really good ratio of uh, experienced astronomers and, and folks that are brand new. And we're just trying to make it as easy as possible to get out there, reduce that learning curve. There's no substitute from getting out there and figuring it out yourself. Um, but uh, I think with some really helpful uh, literature from the Astronomical League, sorry, my screen's uh, blending it out, but the Universe Sampler is a really good, it's a, a introductory text, very simple. Um, and then also, too, we're thinking about making a combo deal for $20 of the universe sampler and then a very basic planisphere. Um, the actual cost is like $24. Uh, the club will eat that cost. So there's no, there's no uh, fundraiser here. This is just trying to make it as easy as possible uh, for individuals. I would say, you know, young adults and their families to uh, individuals that are really interested in kind of getting the foundations. And, uh, and then from there, you know, the... The, the sky is yours. So uh, look for more to come. But again, we're looking at um, April, uh, mid-April, and then April 21st uh, at the Pert Analysis uh, Public Star Party would be kind of culminating event to two meeting series. Any questions? Um, okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, Chris. We're looking forward to that. Uh, I might also mention that Bob Snyder and I are also working on a, a similar kind of program for beginning astrophotographers. Again, very basic stuff. Uh, but the, uh, the thing we've decided to do is not try to go find the dark sky side or take this out to Bad Wolf Ranch for the two hour drive, is we're looking for a place close to uh, central Austin. We know it'll be light polluted, but we wanna work with that uh, and just go over the simple things like uh, polar alignment, uh, uh, tracking and uh, uh, guiding and uh, focusing. Uh, so we know we have some guys with new equipment and they just aren't able to uh, wrap their hands around everything. So we want to kind of uh, 
uh, knock out some of those simple things to help them get started. And if we get an, if we we're able to go and record an image on a session like that, that'll be great. Uh, so uh, this should be probably April, May timeframe too. When we have that set up, we'll uh, we'll let you know. Uh, okay. Uh, one final thing to say, I guess, about uh, member services is. Uh, we are in a position that we can uh, hold a members only party, I think, out at Bad Wolf now. Uh, if we, uh, with the, uh, the uh, Omicron uh, wave kind of uh, fading out, and uh, we have a star party out there with everybody social distancing, masking if they want to, and hopefully everybody double vaccinated, if not boosted. Uh, we could uh, we can start holding the uh, the member star parties out there. Uh, we haven't got anybody is stand up to kind of uh, uh, ride herd over that. Uh, so I'm just going to throw it out there. Uh, we have uh, an opportunity actually at the beginning and the end of March for uh, Messier Marathon kind of, of uh, gathering as well. Uh, so what I'm, I guess what I'm waiting for right now, I mean, if, you, if there are several of you out there that are itching to go uh, and we're not uh, saying our designating a day, then uh, talk to us and we uh, let's get on the, uh, the, um, uh, the signal chat thing and uh, let's talk it up and uh, drum up some uh, people that want to go and we'll just organize it and make it happen. <clears throat> So uh, let us know if you're interested and uh, we'll see if we can get a critical mass and, and get a party together out there, uh, maybe late, uh, uh, early, early March or late March. Uh, either is fine with me. Okay, uh, Don, do you have anything from the Alcor for us? Um, nothing particularly updating, uh, just to let folks know that we are still um, hoping for an in-person Astronomical League conference coming up in Albuquerque. That's going to be July 28th through the 30th, and I'm going to go ahead and put the link in the chat. Um, and that is, uh, registration for that should be opening probably towards the end of this month, so I would check back on that page regularly to uh, see when that is going to be open for registration and for making accommodation arrangements. That's probably something that you might want to do ahead of time, so the area it doesn't sell out. Um, otherwise, in other news about the Hill Country, first off, I wanted to put a huge thank you out to the Austin Astronomical Colleague Society. We had over a dozen astronomers and scopes out at a partner star party between Stone Ledge Winery and the Lampasas Friends of the Night Sky group uh, several weeks back. And it was wonderfully well attended. They were so thrilled with the telescope presence, with the knowledge of all of our astronomers, that they want to look at making this a quarterly event. So stay tuned in the coming weeks. We'll have some dates for that for any of you folks that are interested in going up there to do some sky tours, show folks uh, the view through the telescopes and drink some wonderful wine. Um, we do also have uh, two more star parties that the Hill Country Alliance is partnering with, uh, with several other groups, um, and we'll be putting out information to Joyce, uh, who will forward that to the outreach folks within AAS. Uh, the first is going to be a star party held all the way out at Devil's River Natural State Area. Um, this is going to be currently scheduled for March 26th, with a backup date the first Friday in May. Um, this is actually going to be a bit of a restricted event because of the facilities the drive and uh, the available resources. So uh, we're looking at between about six and eight astronomers. There will be overnight accommodations provided in a cabin uh, with minimal equipment needed to be brought in by the astronomer. Um, but again, I'll be providing information to Joyce on that soon. And we're also partnering with Jester King Winery and Brewery uh, for a star party on Earth Day, April 22nd. So more information to come. Uh, the other thing I wanted to also chime in on uh, for those of you that may not be familiar with, um, and some of you may have heard the, the term ASAP or ACAP, which is the Astronomy in Chile Educator Ambassadors Program. Uh, this is a partnership and collaboration between the Associated Universities um, 
Incorporated and the Association for Universities for Research in Astronomy. And what it does is it brings in uh, astronomers, planetary personnel, informal and formal educators into astronomy facilities in Chile. Um, so those are specifically CI, uh, CTIO, Gemini, uh, the National Science Foundation's Optical Infrared Astronomy Research Laboratory, uh, the National Radio Astronomy Observatory, and ALMA. Um, this is a partnership that's also been in the past supported by the National Science Foundation, and applications for 2022 have opened up for that. Um, I'll put the link and the deadline in the chat. Um, there are three of us from the Central Texas Austin area and three of us from AAS, uh, Amy Jackson with Starry Sky of Austin and Rob Pettengill um, and myself who are all ASAP uh, ambassadors. Mind you, I became an ambassador in 2020, right before COVID. So I actually haven't yet been to Chile, uh, but it is on the docket for hopefully by the end of this year. Uh, but that application is open. Um, and I encourage any of you who have an interest in not only going to, to tour these facilities and partner with some amazing organizations, uh, but the program is also designed to set you up so that when you come back, you have an opportunity um, to share these experiences with the local community, with the astronomical community, with schools, uh, with the general public. So it's, it's a great opportunity uh, to really get out there and, and see some amazingly high altitude dark skies. And hopefully I'll be able to share a lot more about that uh, when I actually come back. <laughs> All right, I'm uh, jealous. You're gonna get uh, one of the bucket list items before I do. Yeah. I'm very eager for those, uh, those Southern skies and the large and small Magellanic clouds. It's, it's gonna be pretty awesome. Yeah, what's, what's the altitude there? Uh, so the the residential area where we're lodging is at ten thousand, and then the observatories we go up to uh, sixteen five. Wow! Oh God, I would love to see that. You can always fill out an application, and submit it. Been able to observe at nine thousand, but yeah, that would that would be amazing. And that's all I have, Terry. Okay, thank you, Don. I don't have any too much on the uh, business agenda right now. Uh, the thing that uh, is looming is our elections, uh, which we hold in April, which means we need a slate of candidates uh, uh, put together uh, pretty pronto. Uh, kind of uh, really getting a slow start here. I don't actually have the nominating committee yet. I need to get that done this week. So I will be contacting several people to work on the nominating committee. Uh, so uh, for, for you guys that are new or not familiar with the process, you know, the, your club is run by a set of uh, one, two, three, four, five main officers and a couple of equipment chairs and uh, several members at large uh, that basically represent the uh, the member community. Uh, we, uh, <clears throat> so we have a, a president, a vice president, treasurer, secretary, the main offices, our outreach chair, our communications chair, and uh, uh, member services and equipment. Uh, uh, currently we have a couple of key roles that are not filled. We don't have member services. Uh, we don't have VP. And uh, we've got spotty coverage on our treasurer right now. Uh, so uh, uh, it's kind of, uh, like I said, we've been in sort of a sustaining mode with COVID for a long time. We're gonna come out of that this spring and we really want to uh, get this club back into shape and, uh, and get it uh, humming again. We're gonna need all of these uh, slots filled to do that. So. Uh, anybody who uh, is out there that thinks they would like to contribute in a leadership position, uh, you can go ahead and, and uh, email uh, uh, nominate at, uh, at austinastro.org or contact any existing officer and let them know of your interest uh, and we'll, we'll funnel you the right way. Uh, so... 
Uh, once we have the nominating committee together, I've got a list of people I, I want them to look at. I don't, the president's supposed to be kind of off to the side from that, but I have some leads I want some folks to chase down uh, so we can get started on that. Uh, hopefully, uh, we can, uh, we can uh, fill out this, uh, this slate uh, and, and really get off to a good start on our, our next uh, term. Uh, the terms start in uh, June, so we have the elections in April, and then uh, new officers take up their post on, in, on June. Uh, are there any questions anybody has about, uh, you can ask about the positions or how the elections work. Uh, it might be behoove us to talk about how the elections work. So by our bylaws, a, a couple of things, if, if there, if you have a, a slate of members and nobody's contesting any position, you don't have to have a vote for that. So if there's just one person for a position, uh, you know, there's, you, you don't really have to hold the vote. Uh, the other thing is our bylaws say that we need to uh, elect uh, uh, the office, uh, elect the slate uh, in person at uh, at a at a GA meeting. So, uh, Joyce, what are our options there? I mean, what I don't even remember what we did in the last couple of years. I think we were uncontested on everything, so we didn't really have to. Uh, yeah, I, I think that that's right. We we kind of did a work around because you know, what, there was no other way to do it and nobody objected. So um, I guess I would just hope that the way things are going, maybe we can manage to have a, an in-person meeting in, in April. But uh, if not, we'll just do another workaround because we obviously have to have the election and we just have to do what, uh, what we have to do. Okay. Um, so if uh, any of you are approached by a member of the nominee committee, I hope uh, you'll give them due consideration and really think hard about this because we need you. Okay. Uh, with that, uh, Brian, uh, actually he was driving earlier. I don't think he was able to make the meeting and I'm not sure I didn't clear it with him that he had a what's up in astronomy. So we'll skip that section and move right on to our speaker. Uh, so uh, tonight uh, we have uh, Richard Nugent with us, who is a long-term uh, AAS member. Uh, he's uh, got an astronomy background. He is uh, his, he was uh, a graduate uh, in uh, Florida. Uh, got his master's and PhD. I don't remember the university right now. Uh, and uh, he did some work with uh, world-class uh, uh, professors and. Uh, Astro, I can't pronounce it, astrometry, <laughs> positional uh, astronomy. So uh, uh, that is the precise location of objects in space, uh, which is going to be germane to, to his topic here tonight. Uh, uh, Richard had a long career with, uh, with NASA, and uh, he has also for several years been the executive secretary of IOTA, which is the uh, the uh, group that does the uh, transit uh, monitoring for uh, occultations, basically. Uh, so uh, they are the ones that go out and watch asteroids eclipse stars. And there are several other things there, but uh, tons of interesting data that they pull out of these kind of events. And it's taken Richard all over the world to catch these events. He's, he's been probably on every continent uh, because the, uh, the, uh, it's a narrow strip on the ground that you're going to see these things. And so you have to be in the right place at the right time, ready with your equipment. And uh, he's a master at that. But tonight he's going to talk to us about determining stellar uh, and galactic distances. So Richard, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thank you, Terry. And... Okay, we got your screen. Okay. Thank you for the, uh, the opportunity to talk, Terry, and thank you for that introduction. Actually, if I ever make it to Australia, then I can brag that I've been to all seven continents. Can everyone hear me? Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this talk is about determining stellar and galactic distances. And um, 
what we're going to talk about are 10 different distance method techniques used by astronomers. There's more, but these are some of the more common ones and the easiest ones to explain and understand. Starting with four, uh, a couple of geometrical methods, uh, trig parallax, dynamical parallax, moving cluster technique. And then we have several luminosity techniques determining uh, the distance of celestial objects. These are based upon the inverse square law of light. And then we'll talk about um, some astrophysical technique, which is the H2 regions, and then supernovas and redshift. And with that, we'll proceed with the first technique, which is called trigonometric parallax. This is the one most everyone's familiar with. It's based upon the uh, motion of the earth around its orbit around the sun, creating a baseline to watch stars move from side to side as the earth goes from one side of the orbit to the other. And just before the Hipparchos and the Gaia satellite were launched, we had a little over 8,000 parallaxes measured from ground-based telescopes. And only about 2,000 were reliable to about 15% precision due to the nature of the errors and the large errors associated with these type of measurements. Because we're looking to measure uh, shifts of a star against the background of less than one arc second. And the largest known parallax, the star of Alpha Centauri in the southern constellation Centaurus has a parallax of 0.762 arc seconds. And to give you an idea of how much of an angle this is, the planet Mars, when it reaches its closest approach to Earth, might be 25 arc seconds. So this is a very tiny angle to measure. So this puts the limit of ground-based measurements to about 40 or 42 parsecs. And there's also instrumental problems with this technique, which I'll show in another slide. And when the Aparco satellite was launched, this is back 1989, the data wasn't released for 10 years because the Europeans, they owned that satellite and they got first grab of the measurements to publish their papers. The precision increased, it was 10 times better. We could measure distances to about 100 parsecs with about a 10% accuracy. And 100, 100 parsecs, again, a parsec is three and a quarter light years. It's just much easier mathematically to use parsecs in these calculations. So uh, if you need to convert to light years from your own personal self, just multiply these numbers by three and a quarter. Then comes the Gaia satellite, which was launched in 2013, and it had several data releases. And the most recent data release was about a year ago, a little over a year ago, data release three, actually called early data release three. And it gave us precisions a hundred times better than the Hipparchos. So we're, we're now, 10,000 times better than ground-based telescope. And look at this precision down here. Uh, it's like a micro arc second. <laughs> okay, this is the concept of parallax. The upper animation, black and white, you can see the earth moving around the sun and you can see the shifting of the star in the background against the background of stars. And this lower animation, I believe I was click on to get it going. Yeah, here's the next animation on the bottom. You can see the star moving across the background, the parallax technique. So this is the one most everyone's familiar with. And we'll just kind of move on to the next slide. Okay, the first stellar parallax ever measured was by Frederick Bessel in the year 1838. And this is after hundreds of years of trying by people from different, different countries, trying to figure out how far the stars were away. And it only was able to be measured by Bessel based upon the improvement in the instruments and the telescopes, because these angles are so small. He measured the trig parallax of the double star 61 Cygni in the constellation Cygnus. And it's a, by the way, it's a pretty star, pretty double star to look at. Two fifth magnitude stars with a separation of about 31 arc seconds, two yellowish stars. And it's, it's a pretty fast moving object proper motion wise. And he measured the value of, came to 0.314 arc seconds. And before he published his results, he took his telescope entirely apart, reassembled it, and redid the measurements, which took another year. And he came out with pretty much the same answer. So he published his result and uh, 3.314 arc seconds, which is very close to the modern value of 0.285 arc seconds. The distance of this system is three and a half parsecs. Okay, on the left here is a location of 61 Sydney and the constellation of Cygnus. It kind of makes a nearly perfect square with Deneb and a few other bright stars in the constellation. Okay, 
Now here's the instrumental problem with the ground-based parallax technique. The measurements are made six months apart, starting at this position and then this position here on the other side of the Earth's orbit. This position in the upper diagram is made at sunset. And at sunset, you're looking at a star this way, you're looking at just after sunset, when it gets dark, the problem with the instruments is that they have not reached thermal equilibrium with the outside air. And we all know this as astronomers by looking at stars visually after sunset, the seeing conditions don't get better until at least say midnight or early hours of the morning. And this causes problems for one part of the measurements. Now, six months later, when we're observing at sunrise, this problem doesn't exist. I mean, it exists, but the instrumentation and the atmosphere has cooled down, the telescope has reached circle, thermal equilibrium, and the conditions, sky conditions are much better. And as you can see, the geometry here is just basically junior high geometry, seventh grade geometry to compute the distance to the object. We know one AU over here, we know that distance. We know the parallax angle, the unknown distance, small d, is computed by this formula. This is again from seventh grade math. And for those of you that are not math geniuses, most of your hand calculators can do the tangent function if you want to do that. But you don't need to because the tangent of such small angles is just about equivalent to the angle itself. So you just invert the parallax in arc seconds and you get the distance in parsecs. Okay. If there's any questions on any of these, please, please shout out. This slide shows the uh, motion and parallax of, of Barnard star, which is the third nearest star to our solar system. And in the lower left, we have three images of the star taken over uh, a one year time period. Starting on the bottom image, September 8th. The next image, the central image was taken March 20th. Six months later and six months after that, back again, September of the next year. So you can see the wavy motion that Barnard sort of creates on this graph on the right due to its trigonometric parallax. The red arrow, the red directional arrow here is Barnard star's proper motion. It's motion across the sky in arc seconds, and it has the largest proper motion known over 10 arc seconds per year. You could, with our modern digital single lens reflex cameras, you can photograph Barnard star, say now, well, when it's visible, and try it a year later, you should be able to see the displacement. Okay. The Hipparco satellite, uh, abbreviated High Precision Parallax Collecting Satellite, it obtained trig parallaxes for some 118,000 stars uh, with errors on the order of a thousand of a, of a park second. So that pushed the ground based limit over here, 25 or 40 parsecs, way out to about 100 parsecs with a 10% error. So part of the Hipparcos mission, they measured some Cephe variables for the first time. And I, the number I looked up was 223 Cephe variables, Cephe stars, and they claim that 26 are reliable. And the Cephe technique is a technique we'll talk about later. Okay, next comes the Gaia satellite. This was also launched by the Europeans in 2013 and they've released the data over, over time. They've made unprecedented positional measurements of over a billion stars. Actually, it's 1.8 billion because I looked at the catalog the other day. It is just fantastic. Uh, this satellite was uh, put at Earth's Lagrangian L2 point. And the purpose of that is to get it away from the, the heating problems and the caused by the Earth's atmosphere. It has um, collected data on positions, the brightness, radial velocities, and colors for the objects in its field of view. And the typical field of view would have 70 passes, indicating uh, 70 different um, measurements for a particular, particular object. And as I said earlier, the data has been released in phases. The final data released should be sometime this year, they're promising. They say early 2022, so it'll be coming out soon. And in addition, the Gaia satellite has also measured positions of asteroids and uh, get accurate position to asteroids. And this is for updating their orbits and also for us occultation observers that observe these things. Okay, here's the data releases, uh, 2016, 2018, 2020. As I mentioned earlier, the 2018, the third data release, 1.8 billion objects released, stars. And you can look up this information on the, uh, the ESA Gaia webpage. You can pull out the data for just about any star you want. 
All you have to do is enter the coordinates. So as I said earlier, you've got 1.8 billion stars measured to about magnitude 21. And they use what they call a five parameter Tycho Gaia solution to get these uh, measurements of their parallaxes and proper motions. There's also light curves and characteristics for variable stars. And um, also positions and magnitudes for over 2000 quasars. Now the luminosity techniques we'll talk about later involve the inverse square law of light. And this is a demonstration of the inverse square law of light. Let's say you have a light bulb or a light source over here in the upper part of the diagram. If you're one unit away, you have one unit of distance, you have a certain amount of brightness. If you double that distance, your brightness decreases by a factor of four, one fourth due to the inverse square law. If you're three times further away, you're one ninth as bright, one over r squared, one over three squared is nine, so you're only one ninth as bright. And we know this uh, from looking at, if you take a 100 watt light bulb and you look at it, or take a 60 watt light bulb, look at it at say 10 feet, and then put it 100 feet away, 10 times further, it's gonna be one one hundredth as bright. So with astronomy, we're trying to determine if we're looking at a 100 watt light bulb or a 60 watt light bulb, the distance is very important. Of course, we wouldn't see a light bulb at the distance of you know, light years or parsecs. Now, one of the most important formulas and methods for determining distance is the uh, determining the absolute magnitude of an object compared to the apparent magnitude. M, little lowercase m, is the apparent magnitude of an object as seen from Earth. Uppercase m is called the absolute magnitude. It is the apparent magnitude of a star viewed at a standard distance of 10 parsecs which is 32.6 light years. Now, why did they pick these 10 parsec distance? Well, um, let's continue. This is the distance formula, one of the basic formulas for determining distances in the field of astronomy. If we subtract apparent magnitude minus absolute magnitude, it will equal five times the logarithm of R minus five. LOG is log, it's a mathematical function, just like sines and cosines. You can do it on your hand calculator, look it up on a computer. It's not that difficult. So solving for R, the distance in parsecs, we use this formula. We have, the, we have the number 10 raised to this power. This power is M minus M plus five divided by five. And the M minus M quantity is also known as the distance modulus. But for the purposes of this talk, we'll just call it the distance formula. This brings us to the HR diagram which was created over hundred years ago by two astronomers in Europe, uh, Eginar Hersprung and Henry Norris Russell. And they pretty much came up with this diagram around 1911 to 1914 independently. Back then, trigonometric parallaxes were known for a couple hundred stars. And what they did, they plotted the absolute magnitude of these objects versus the spectral type. And they came out with what's known as the HR diagram. And it turns out, that 90% of all stars, let me switch to the next slide, lie on the main sequence, what we call the main sequence, which is this line, kind of a slightly wavy line from upper left to lower right. And supergiants and giants are in another area as well as white dwarfs in a separate area in the diagram. It's a plot of the absolute magnitude on the left-hand scale, up vertical scale, versus the spectral type on the bottom scale. The spectral type O, B, A, F, G, K, and M also corresponds to their temperatures. You'll notice that the main sequence line here is not a perfect line, it's got quite a bit of scatter to it. And this is due to the fact that the chemical composition of the stars is not identical. A G-type star uh, is not always gonna fall within, you know, or at K times or whatever. There's certain differences between the stars, they're not all identical. There's variation depending upon their mass and slight chemical composition. Each of these spectral types is broken into um, zero through nine. You could have a G zero star, a G five star, a G nine star, just depends. Okay, moving right along. Now we have the mass luminosity relationship in which um, if we plot the absolute magnitude on the left versus the mass of the object, uh, this is done for studying a binary stars. Most of the data points fall on a pretty straight line like this. 
and this this determining of this diagram is good enough for masses up to about 15 solar masses. And I'll demonstrate this on the next slide here using the method of dynamical parallax. This is, next, this is beyond trig parallax. We use dynamical parallaxes on binary stars. And we use Newton's version of Kepler's third law. So you're familiar with Kepler's third law, the period squared equals the distance cubed. Uh, many of you are familiar with that that uh, mathematical formula. Well, Newton's version of it uh, includes the sum of the masses of the two objects and converted to arc seconds, A, we use that instead of distance uh, in, in uh, astronomical units. So there's two unknowns here. There's one equation and two unknowns. We don't know the masses and we don't know the R. So how could we possibly solve this equation for the distance? Well, here's how we do it. You have a binary star system and you take a guess for the value of the sum of the masses of the objects. You put that in the formula. You know the period, you know the separation because you can see it visually. You put it in the formula, you come up with a distance for r in parsecs. With a distance for r in parsecs, you then go back and compute the absolute magnitude using the distance formula. And then you go to this scale over here in the upper right, and you look up the absolute magnitude and you go across and you get a new value for the masses of the stars. Now, in reality, astronomers don't just look at the graph, they have this in a table. You just look it up on a table. So with the new value of the masses, you plug that back into your formula one more time and you get another value for the distance. And you keep doing this until the distance doesn't change. This is called uh, iteration, you math geniuses, the process of iteration. So, I got two examples here of uh, two double star systems. The first one is, um, I can't see it because the Zoom stuff is covering up the screen, but this is WDS, Washington Double Star Catalog. I believe it's 22 something. It's period known is 128 and a half years. The separation is 0.24 arc seconds. And the apparent magnitude is 7.23 of the two stars. So what we do is we estimate that these two stars based upon their spectral type is uh, two solar masses. We plug in two to our equation. We solve for the distance r. We get 133 parsecs. 133 parsecs gives us an absolute magnitude of 1.6. So we go on the scale here, we look at 1.6 absolute magnitude, which is down over here somewhere. We go across and get a new value for the masses. It's actually a little bit larger than 2.7. Again, this is not perfect graph here, not the scale. And we take that 2.7 mass and we plug it back in the formula again, we get another distance, 144. We do it again, this process of iteration, we get a third value of 148 parsecs, and this is about where it converges. And this turns out to be a parallax of 0 0.0067 arc second. There's no way a ground-based telescope could measure this type of stellar parallax. We need a double star system to do it. The next example, GC27350, the same technique, uh, this period is now 243 years, the separation 2.15 arc seconds. Here's the parent magnitude. We guess at the value of R, we guess at the value, excuse me, of the sum of the masses, two solar masses. We compute R and that gives us an absolute magnitude of minus 3.96, basically minus four. We go up to the curve here, the, the graph, sorry. And we look up minus 3.96, somewhere over here. We move over here, we get a new value for the sum of the masses. Turns out to be 8.4. We plug in 8.4 into our calculation. We run it through, we run it through. So we keep doing this. And finally, we get a value of 41 parsecs as it appears to have merged with 40.5. And that's the final value, a distance of 41 parsecs. You notice we started out with 23 parsecs on this first uh, estimate. And our sum of the masses kept on changing. And uh, we finally end up with this value down here. So this is a technique to take us out to uh, uh, these distances of greater than uh, 100 parsecs. And there, was, there was a limitation to this technique. It's limited by the separation that you can see in the stars and also you have to be able to measure the period. Now, obviously no one's been alive for 243 years to measure the period of this one, but we rely upon plots on a graph to determine uh, and extrapolate entire orbit out of this. Same goes for this one. Okay. The next technique is the uh, moving cluster technique. 
And this is a technique was first used with the Hyades star cluster. And um, star clusters, open star clusters, they have the same general motion in space. They move together as a group. And we measure their proper motions. And it turns out their proper motions will be converging toward a single point in the sky. Here's an example of a bunch of stars with proper motions. And you can see they converge at a certain point over here. Uh, the same thing happens uh, if you're looking at a row down here, lower right hand picture, it appears that the, the two white lines converge toward a single point. Okay, here's the uh, Hyades cluster uh, members, their proper motions plotted. You have a convergence point on the left here. This is done years ago. And it was redone a couple of years ago, but there's other group of astronomers and it's pointing in a different direction. That's due to the fact that the scale, the right ascension scale, they reversed it compared to these two images. Uh, the left one, it's got the, uh, the right ascension increasing going to the left. The right one has it increasing going toward the right. So it's actually flipped a mirror image. But you can see the individual proper motions of the stars, they do point toward a point called the convergence point. And these, uh, the people that published this paper, they pondered their point versus two other points that were known in the past. Now, once you know the convergence point, you can use this formula to get individual um, parallaxes of the stars. This is a formula from uh, galactic astronomy. And you gotta be careful because non-cluster members can bias the convergence point. They can you know, contaminate the data. So this limit has, uh, this technique has a limit of about 500 parsecs distance. And it was done for the Hyades, and the Hyades is the most fundamental cluster we know because its distance represents the fundamental distance scale of which all other distances are measured. Because the members of the Hyades are believed to be typical stars that we'd find anywhere in the galaxy or other galaxies. Okay, so clusters that have been using this technique, the Hyades, a distance of about 45 parsecs, using 145 stars. The Pleiades cluster, the distance is about 134.4 parsecs, give or take 2.9 parsecs, 64 stars measured. This is from a 2016 paper. Then the Scorpio Centaurus group, distance is 130 parsecs, 102 stars measured. Now these distances is not of any individual star, it's the average distance of the entire cluster, okay? Okay, let's find out where we are in the distance scale relative to our galaxy. This is a, uh, my little drawn in edge on view of the galaxy of the Milky Way. And on the top, we have a circle, which is 1000 parsecs in diameter, okay? The dot at the center of this circle is 100 parsecs which is the distance limit from the Hipparco satellite. Okay, so this expanded circle down here, we have the trig parallax limit here um, is about 100 parsecs. The dynamical parallax limit takes us up to about 200 parsecs. That's about the lim realistic limit of that technique. And the moving cluster technique takes us up to about 500 parsecs. So this is how far we've gotten with these last three techniques with respect to the Milky Way. Now the Gaia satellite, of course, has taken us much further as we'll see as we continue. Okay, in looking at stars and looking at their brightness, we have this issue called extinction or absorption of light. If you're looking at an object in the plane of the galaxy, if you're looking toward the center of the galaxy, the object's light is going to be absorbed by the material between you and the object. This is called interstellar reddening or interstellar extinction or absorption. When you're looking perpendicular to the plane of the galaxy, you're looking through less material, less light's gonna be absorbed. And this is something astronomers have to take into account when they're computing distances using the light that's received, because that light could have passed through much of the Milky Way's gas and dust, absorbing it, making it appear fainter, okay? It also makes it appear redder. Okay, um, main sequence fitting. This is another technique as we move further out and determining distances. This is done for star clusters also. What we do is we take an existing star cluster in which we have a known distance. And this could be done from some of the other techniques. And we plot an HR diagram for that cluster. Okay, and that's the upper diagram. The unknown cluster at the unknown distance is what we're trying to find out. So I'm gonna to move to the next slide here. This is, how, this is how we figure it out. What we do is we make an HR diagram for the unknown cluster 
and and we using its apparent magnitude, small m. We'll have an HR dynamic looking something like this, depending on how many stars we uh, we plot on it. So we have to look at the spectral type of each star, and we plot it versus the magnitude, absolute sorry, the apparent magnitude, the way we see it from Earth. Now the known cluster of known distance, uh, with this is, a absolute, this is a calibrated HR diagram with apparent magnitudes. We have a shift here. You can see that this, the unknown distance to the unknown cluster has got a shift in the, uh, the main sequence line. This amount of the shift is equal to the quantity m minus m, small m minus m, which is the distance formula, the left-hand side of the distance formula. So we compute that shift, and this is kind of read off the graph in averages, and we have five log r minus five, and that's how we compute the distance. This is a very powerful technique, and it, um, it um, can take us out much further than the other techniques as far as distance. Okay, it's even used for globular clusters. Okay, let's continue. So here's the technique of how we do it. I just described it. And if you use a lot of stars, the, uh, the thing here is the magnitude. The more stars you use, the better your magnitude errors are, and they can approach two tenths of a magnitude. And uh, so the limitation of this technique is about 10 or 15 kiloparsecs. That's a thousand parsecs. So 100 to 100, excuse me, 1,000 to 1,500 kiloparsecs, uh, parsecs, distance limit. Okay, and also globular clusters, they have what is known as population two time stars. They require a slightly different HR main sequence. Okay, so let's find out where we are now. Here's the Milky Way. Here's a one kiloparsec diameter uh, distance. And the main sequence fitting technique can take us out to about 10 or 15 kiloparsecs just beyond the center of the galaxy. So again, we're starting to move out further and further and further. The uh, next technique is called spectroscopic parallax. And this one's gonna have some of the largest errors of the parallax technique. What we do is we uh, obtain the star spectrum of the star. Once we determine the spectral type and the luminosity class, we can go to the HR diagram, look it up on the, on the, on the, on the uh, diagram right here. Let's say it's a G0 star. Okay, let's put that about right here. So we look up on the diagram and we get an absolute magnitude over here. With that absolute magnitude and the known apparent magnitude of that star, which we can see, we have the left-hand side of the equation of the distance formula. So we're simply solving for R, the distance to the object. Now, as I said, this particular technique has the largest errors because of the, uh, as you can see, the main sequence here, there's quite a bit of variation <laughs> When we get the when we're looking for the absolute magnitude, and this is the issue with this particular technique. So the error is typically 25, 30 percent, but it is a way of determining the distance to objects. And uh, the limitation of this technique is about 50 kiloparsecs, which is the distance to the long and small Magellanic clouds. Okay, let's move on. Any questions on this so far? Okay. Here's a uh, Here's the spectrum of the various stars in the uh, spectral sequence, O, B, A, F, K, and M. On the top is the O-type stars. You can see the spectral lines. And as we get further and further down the spectrum of the different type stars, you see the A0-5 stars. This is uh, a spectral class A0, luminosity class 5. It's a very, very clean spectrum. Very clean. You've got, this is what we call the Balmer series of, of absorption lines. You've got the h uh, gamma line over here, H delta here, and they just keep coming to left. The distance between them is, is about half a third from the previous. So this is a very clean spectrum over here. As we get further down, F, G, K, and M type stars, you have more and more absorption lines in the spectrum. This is due to the extra elements and metals in the star's atmosphere. And it's believed that these stars, the G and K and M type stars, <clears throat> were formed out of the material from supernovas which created these heavier elements. So that's how this works. And I'm no astrophysicist, this is not my specialty, but uh, this is a slide I gave, they gave us, they gave us this in graduate school. They said, here, you can have it. So I've kept it all these years. Okay, here's another example of the uh, uh, spectroscopic parallax with the star Ilnath, the second brightest star in Taurus. We know its spectral type. 
uh, B7 luminal acid class three. We know it's uh, apparent magnitude, uh, 1.65. And we know uh, from the HR diagram, we compute the spectroscopic parallax, um, absolute magnitude one point, minus 1.5. And that gives us a distance of 43 parsecs. Again, here's one of the tables that astronomers use to compute these uh, apparent magnitudes and absolute magnitudes. Here you have your O-type star, B-type star, and so on. This is in, uh, you can look this up online, these tables. Now the trig parallax comes out to 0.02436 arc seconds, which gives a distance of 41.05 parsecs. Pretty good match with the spectroscopic parallax example. And that's only because this is a very nearby star and its distance is, its, sorry, its brightness is known very accurately. And there's very little material to absorb the light and contaminate the data for the, uh, the, uh, the magnitude measurements. Okay. Now with this technique, spectroscopic parallax, it pushes our limit out to about 50 kiloparsecs, which is the distance of the large and small Magellanic clouds. Next technique is the period luminosity relationship. And this is usually come from the SEPI variable stars. They were first discovered by Henrietta Leavitt in the early 1900s in the small Magellanic cloud. And their periods were, appeared to be directly related to their apparent magnitudes. And uh, Harlow Shapley saw this important result and he helped pioneer the distance determinations in our galaxy. The SEPI variables are, are very, very luminous, thus they are visible in very large distances. And with this technique, knowing their period and apparent magnitudes, um, we can construct another, again, an HR diagram, a diagram and get their uh, distance. And the next slide will show this. Uh, we have your type one cepheids, your type two cepheids and the RR Lyra type variables. Uh, once you know their period of days on the bottom axis, you just go up, you go across, you get the absolute magnitude. With the absolute magnitude, you know their apparent magnitude. Again, the distance formula applies and you get the distance. And for some reason, Cepi variables are very, very far away from us as none very, very, very combined. So we had to rely upon the Hipparchos uh, satellite to get the, uh, the, the distances of these objects by trig parallax and calibrate this diagram. Okay, now with the Cepi luminosity relationship, our distance has been pushed out to about four megaparsecs, our distance limit. And this is, about, this is about the limit we're going to see in this technique, because when you start getting at these distances, it's hard to resolve individual stars in other galaxies. All right. Uh, here's the Milky Way. Here's the LMC, SMC. Here's M31, uh, 0.85 megaparsecs away, which is like 2.3 million light years. And the rate of the Cepheid variables takes us out this far. OK, let's continue. Next technique is the blue, the blue, super, the blue, the blue stars. These are super bright stars. The uh, blue stars, the O and B type stars in the spectral sequence. That's, those are the stars in the upper left hand corner of the HR diagram. They're very, very bright. They have mag absolute magnitudes between minus eight and minus 10. They're very massive. They're the most luminous and because they're so bright, we can see them at huge distances. They're visible in other galaxies. So we measure their, uh, once we know their spectral type, we know their absolute luminosity. We can look it up on, on the table, on the diagram. And we can use, again, with the apparent magnitude measurement, we get the quantity on the left, M minus M, and it's very easy to solve at the distance R. And again, the limitation of this technique is about 10 megaparsecs due to the difficulty in identifying stars in other galaxies. You know, when you look at a galaxy, even with the great telescopes, with the big telescopes, it's very difficult to resolve individual stars. It can be done, but it's very difficult. Okay, next technique is uh, H2 regions. And in H2 regions, is, uh, it's, it's caused by the ionization of interstellar hydrogen from very hot O and B type stars. Remember the O and B type stars are the most luminous. They're the brightest, the most massive. They put out tremendous amounts of energy and light and radiation. And this radiation, it, it ionizes uh, the atoms out to a certain distance. 
And once that distance is reached, you see a sharp boundary. So that you can actually measure the width of the, bat of the, of the size of the H2 region. And with that distance known, with that quantity known, we can compute the distance using the spectroscopic parallax technique and certain parts of the spectrum, the emission line width. So um, the technique involves measuring the linear size of the H2 region. And then it's a simple matter of computing the, the uh, with a linear <coughs> size, it's a simple matter of computing the distance. A limitation of this technique, about 15 megaparsecs. Um, the Orion Nebula, the Lagoon Nebula, the Trivet Nebula, the Eagle Nebula, the Rosetta Nebula, these are all H2 regions. Here's the galaxy M51 in uh, Ursa Major. And all of these little pink areas, these are H2 regions, okay? All these pink areas. So you could look at these and you can measure their size and you can compute the distance of the, uh, the object, which is the distance of the galaxy. That's a very pretty picture of, M30, of M51, by the way, I think. Okay, so H2 regions have taken us out to about 15 megaparsecs away from our Milky Way galaxy. Here we have the Cepheids. Here we have the bright blue stars, H2 regions. And here's 25 megaparsecs. We're not quite out here yet. Okay, next technique, supernova. This is a very, very fabulous technique to determine distances. And from the analysis and the studies of supernovas, the studies indicate there's two main types of supernova, type one and type two. Type one has the characteristics with a sudden spectacular brightening, which is what a supernova does. Then they have a brightness fall off in about a month, rapidly, and then a one or two year decline in brightness. And from, from the distances of other techniques to galaxies and the absolute magnitude of the supernova, type two, type one, is, comes out to about minus 19.3. And this is known pretty accurately, give or take two tenths of a magnitude. The type two supernova also have a rapid increase in brightness upon you know, the thing going off. And then a rapid brightness fall off in about a month, like the type ones, but then a much faster decline in brightness of about 50 days. And then there's another two magnitude fading in brightness, from like 60 to 120 days. This is a different type of drop off in brightness. And the absolute magnitude of these objects around minus 16.6, again, give or take two tenths of a magnitude. Now there's other, other types, well, subtypes of these uh, supernova. There's a type 1A, 1B, 1C, 2B, 2L, 2P and 2N. And each of these have all been calibrated to get their absolute magnitudes. Uh, there's about a three magnitude difference between type 1A, the brightest, and the faintest one, which is like type 2P. Okay, um, the supernovas have, uh, once we know the apparent, the apparent magnitude of the supernova, and we know what type of supernova it is, we can use the distance modulus formula to get the distance. And, uh, between 2016 and 2020, it was averaging 6,000 to 10,000 discoveries per year, as the, the bottom chart shows. And once we know the apparent magnitude, and the limit of this is for ground-based telescopes is about magnitude plus 25, that limits our distance to about 2,000 megaparsecs, which is 2 billion parsecs. Uh, the Hubble Space Telescope can go a little bit further to magnitude 28, increasing our distance to about 28,000 megaparsecs. Now, most supernova in the early 90s, 80s, and 70s, these were discovered by amateurs and some professionals. Amateurs would take out their telescopes and just look at galaxies night after night after night to see if they saw a new star, a new, a new object appear. And when they thought they had one, they reported them to uh, the, minor, the, the Minor Planet Center and the, and the astronomers would get a hold of the spectrum and start measuring the uh, light curve. Now, these days, here we are in the 21st century, uh, most of these surveys are done by automatic telescopes. Your typical survey telescope will maybe photograph four, five, 600 galaxies per night. and just keep photographing them night after night after night, looking for new objects in the galaxy, which is done by software. So there's a ton of these being discovered every day. So here's the... Uh, 
type 1a supernova, a light curve, you see the rapid increase in brightness at the very beginning, then it fades off rapidly again, and there's a slow decline over the next uh, year or so. Okay. Let's take an example of this. This is a supernova uh, discovered on June 4th, 1994 by our own Houston Astronomical Society member, Larry Mitchell. I'm sure many of you know Larry Mitchell if you go to the Texas Star Party. He's got a big 36 inch telescope over on the north end of the field. And he discovered this one, uh, 94. It turns out it was a uh, type 1a supernova, one of the very bright ones. And its apparent magnitude at the time of discovery was, before discovery, 0.14.8. So assuming the absolute magnitude is minus 19.3, we plug it in our distance formula, we get a distance of r66 plus or minus six megaparsecs. That's pretty far away. Now using the recession velocity, which we'll talk about later, um, the recession velocity of the galaxy is 4,551 kilometers per second, give or take 200 kilometers per second. And using the Hubble log, and we'll talk about this in a second, uh, we get the distance of 61 megaparsecs. That's assuming a Hubble constant of 75 kilometers per second per megaparsec, pretty close agreement, pretty close agreement within the range of errors. Here's another example, the supernova discovered in, let me see here. I can't see the top of my screen due to the, uh, the zoom bar, but a supernova discovered in this galaxy, discovered in 2009, and the uh, you can see the, the star right here, it had apparent magnitude maximum plus 15.1. Its spectrum also indicated it was a type 1a supernova, indicating a distance of 72, give or take, 7 megaparsecs. From the redshift of the galaxy of 5,332 kilometers per second, Hubble log distance gives a distance of 70 megaparsecs, give or take one megaparsec. Excellent agreement with the, uh, the, supernova, the supernova technique. Here's another one, uh, discovered March 11, 2017. And this one, you can see where the star appears, where it wasn't previously in the left hand, uh, left hand screen. Supernova 2017 uh, had a maximum apparent magnitude of plus 11.5. Again, this is a type 1a supernova. And using the distance formula, apparent magnitude minus absolute magnitude, the distance comes out to 14, give or take, 2 megaparsec. The redshift of this galaxy is much lower since it's much closer, 1163 kilometers per second. The Hubble law distance indicates 15, give or take, 4 megaparsecs. Again, excellent agreement with the supernova technique. Now, not all supernovas have distances that match the Hubble law. This particular one in the galaxy, uh, UGC, I believe that's 3105. Again, I 31, can't 3165. 3165, yeah. My, my Zoom bar covers it up. Uh, it was discovered also in 2017. And you can see the, the location of the object, kind of the fuzzy part of the galaxy. It's absolute Sorry, its apparent magnitude came out to plus 17.6. The spectrum indicated it was a type 1n supernova, and this provided the distance of 74, give or take 12 megaparsecs. Now, the redshift gave us a totally different answer here, knowing the redshift of the galaxy, 3783 kilometers per second. The distance came to 51, give or take 4 megaparsecs. So we've got a greater than 23 megaparsec distance. Uh, uh, um, change in distance here, uh, different distances. So what's going on with this one? Well, uh, I did a little research on this one, and uh, there's a paper published in the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society uh, a couple of years ago. And this paper, here's the a, here's a cover page of the paper. They suggested that this supernova exploded in some sort of a cocoon, inside of a cocoon. And you can see from the, uh, the slide, it was kind of inside the galaxy, not quite away, away from it. You know, there's some material between us and the galaxy and inside the galaxy. Um, they suggested that uh, uh, the, the result of this, this, this object was a result of some sort of an outburst or a supernova explosion, not even, con not even convinced it was a supernova explosion, inside a dense circumstellar nebula. 
And this causes problems uh, with determining the, abs the apparent magnitude of the object because it's hidden in a whole bunch of material, some sort of a nebula, okay? And that can contaminate the spectrum, giving a false identification of what type of supernova it is and not knowing the true apparent magnitude that it maxes out at because it's kind of hidden behind material inside this so-called nebula. We're gonna get very, very inconsistent results compared to the Hubble redshift technique. So here's a paper if you wanna look it up, uh, it's online and it's about 20 pages long. 23 authors, and you know, a paper like this, 23 authors, it takes a long time to come to an agreement on the final version. I know this. Okay, let's move on. Next comes the, uh, the Hubble law in terming distances. This was first uh, come up with by Edwin Hubble. He was studying Cepheid variables in nearby galaxies like M31, and he determined that the, uh, the redshift of a galaxy was proportional to the distance of the galaxy. And so he would calibrate his, uh, his data using a whole bunch of other techniques that were known, such as the ones we've talked about. And he came out with a, a value of the Hubble constant. And when he came out with it, it was, uh, I forget the number he came out with, but the range of values for the Hubble constant is ranged from 55 kilometers per second per megaparsec to 80 kilometers per second per megaparsec. Currently, it's believed to be right at 74.2 plus or minus three kilometers per second per megaparsec. Now in the 1970s, the great observational astronomer, Alan Sandage, and his colleague, Gustav Taman, they published a long series of papers in the Astrophysical Journal in the 70s, probably 20 papers, trying to determine the value of the Hubble constant. And their value that they ended up with, they were convinced it was about 55 kilometers per second per megaparsec. They use all kinds of techniques to determine distances to galaxies, plus the measurement of the redshift of galaxies, and that's how they came about that answer. Um, luckily, I was able to meet Alan Sanders in person in the 90s. I flew to California. I brought my Hubble, my Carnegie Atlas of Galaxies, that very large volume that weighs 20 pounds. I chased him down. I got him at his office. And I got him to autograph it for me. So by the way, it's not for sale. And uh, he showed us some stuff that he did on this technique uh, from the 70s. He showed us some, back then, uh, photographs were taken with uh, glass, glass plates in the 70s. This is before CCD cameras. And with glass plates and uh, spectrum and the, and the instrumentation at the time, this is as good as they can do it. Now, the present galactic distance technique, the HST is used to search for faint Cepheid variables in galaxies and also supernova, as we've just seen. And with a 10 meter telescope, we have a practical magnitude limit of plus 25 to plus 28, which takes us out pretty far out. So on the right, here's an animation of the, you know, we all know this from the expansion of the universe. The galaxy near the center here, um, if that's where we're located, the other objects will be moving faster the further far the away. Okay, so here's the Hubble wall plotted out. You have on the vertical scale, left-hand side, the recession velocity of the galaxy. And then you have the distance on the lower, lower scale in megaparsecs. And all of the data points that uh, these people have done plotted on this line came out to pretty straight line. There is some scatter. And the slope of the line is the Hubble constant, which is now believed to be about 73 kilometers per second. This particular diagram says 72, but it changes every time somebody wants to make a name for themselves and uh, put out some new data. Okay, Edwin Hubble used this telescope for his measurements. This is at uh, Mount Wilson in California. I went there to visit one time on a trip. And I took a tour of the observatory. Here's a picture of the telescope. And um, over here, you see this chair that I'm pointing to. The uh, Visitor Center of People said, this is the chair the Hubble sat on when he smoked his pipe, waiting to take the next exposure. I said, that's pretty cool. So interesting piece of history there. Now, our techniques determining distances, we've come this far out. We started out in the Milky Way with trick parallax, dynamical parallax, moving cluster technique. We had the Cepheid variables, the brightest blue stars, supernova, Cepheid variables. And it's taken us out to about this place right here, 100 megaparsecs. 
Beyond a hyperbaric parsecs, we have to rely upon the Hubble constant and the recession velocity of the galaxy to get the distance. And actually, in this range here from 25 to 100 megaparsecs, we have a slight issue with galaxies and clusters. On the lower left is a galaxy cluster rotating. This is just an animation. And what happens is if we're looking at a galaxy and a cluster, which many are at huge distances, there's going to be some contamination of the actual recession velocity due to the motion of the galaxy in the cluster, meaning that some of the galaxies are going to move toward us as they rotate, and some are going to be moving further away as the galaxy cluster rotates. And that extra motion is going to make the recession velocity of that particular galaxy, it's going to make it not perfect. It's what we call peculiar motion. And the peculiar motion, we really don't know the answer to it, but the further and further away you get, uh, the less and less that peculiar motion affects the recession velocity of the galaxy. It, it, it turns into what we call the pure Hubble flow. This is a term the pros use. And this occurs at a redshift of about 7,500 kilometers per second and greater. So less than 7,500 kilometers per second redshift is a, there's a possibility of a peculiar motion of the galaxy within a cluster that can bias the redshift measurement. Uh, the diagram on the right, the lower right, shows the components of the radial velocity, recession velocity. You've got this component here of the, uh, of the move within the cluster, which actually biases the actual recession velocity. This is the, uh, this is the problem with some of the distances. And also with supernova, as we saw in that one supernova, the galaxy, which we had a huge difference in distances from the recession velocity and the actual supernova distance, of supernova measurements. We have lots of problems with supernovas. So um, <clears throat> there, is, there is some bias in the uh, technique for supernovas. Um, but redshift appears to take us, do a very good job beyond this uh, CZ equals 75 kilometers, 7,500 kilometers per second per megaparsec. So that was the last slide. And uh, so we've seen these techniques, these 10 different techniques have taken us out from just nearby our solar system to way, way out. And with that, I will take any questions or comments. Well, I'll start off with one. Um, so for your, your closer in techniques, the uh, trig parallax and the next couple, uh, is it possible for uh, the proper motion to work against the parallax? I mean, your proper motion could go in any direction, I guess, but it could, there could be cases where it's, uh, it's kind of linearly canceling out your parallax if it's a large enough uh, uh, proper motion to notice. It's kind of like the galaxy's rotating, but on a closer scale. That's a very good question. Very good, very good, yeah, very good question. Yes, the proper motion is gonna be involved, but if you do the measurements over years, you can actually cancel that out. It actually cancels out. <clears throat> because proper motion is the, uh, again, it's a projected motion of the star in space in arc seconds per year. So the proper motion, depending on the direction of the proper motion, it could be perpendicular to the parallax measurement. It could be right on it. So yes, it will affect it. But over years, over time period, you can actually, you know, so you can actually subtract that out. I've personally never done a trig parallax. I wanted to do one for my master's thesis, but my major professor said, no, I got something better for you to do. So he said, it takes several years to do it. Now I know you want to graduate and go to Texas and start working on <laughs> this program. So um, we, he gave me something else to do. Any other questions or comments? Uh, actually, I have one. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I know that one of the supernovas has been used as a standard candle is, I believe, the type 2A, where you have a, uh, uh, a white dwarf that accumulates uh, material and detonates at 1.4 solar masses. Is that right? That's your 1A. Yeah, yeah that's the... Uh... Oh, that's the 1A. I'm sorry. Uh, so one of the things I've seen recently from the LIGO is that they're finding um, supernovas that are the result of, of uh, two uh, white dwarfs spinning together uh, and, and uh, joining, uh, where your uh, 
your absolute solar uh, your absolute solar masses are not going to necessarily be 1.4. It could be up to like 2.5 solar masses. Uh, have they had to have they found a way to go back and and look at the 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 one A uh, supernovas and figure out which ones are which? Uh <clears throat> I'm not an expert on this, but when you got a white dwarf involved in an explosion, more than likely it's going to be a nova, not a supernova, because of the low mass. Supernovas are typically masses of six, seven solar masses and higher. So uh, the white dwarfs are probably not going to be supernovas, but just regular novas. And that that's that's the limitation of what I know about those. Again, I'm not an astrophysicist. Um, and that's something that could be probably researched online. But actually, I was watching a uh, how the universe works special the other night and they talked about this and that's what i remember what they said white dwarfs don't have enough mass to become a supernova even two of them supernovas are generally solar mass objects of seven eight nine solar mass solar masses and larger hmm. yeah i thought the 1a was the was a white dwarf that, that accumulates material from a companion star until it reaches 1.4 Exactly, exactly. Yeah, 1.4, which was also known as the Schwarzschild criterion, uh, that's, a, that's a limit. That's a limit on the, yeah, the masses there. But isn't that the, one, isn't that the 1A supernova, though? Um, it, it, it could be, but uh, from what I know, which uh, the, my, the, my knowledge of this is not that great, it takes at least seven or eight solar masses to become a, a type 1A supernova. The, the smaller white dwarfs that pull upon a regular star and draw material, they'll eventually go, go off at a certain point. And that's, that's just a regular nova. That's, that's what I understand. Again, I'm not an expert on this. Um, okay. So um, I'd have to do some more research on that to figure that out. <clears throat> I just wanted to say it's a very nice, comprehensive review of these techniques. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. I appreciate the invitation to, to talk about the group. So another question, if you know, um, the Gaia mission uh, um, basically cataloging 1.8 billion stars. How does it, uh, I mean, is it working on a large field of stars at a time? Uh, sort of like Kepler was staring at, you know, uh, several fields uh, for a fixed period of time to detect uh, exoplanets. I mean, it seems like to get to that number of stars, uh, Gaia must be working on more than one star at a time. Definitely, the, the way these uh, satellites work, they do these scans. So it's a constant scan um, in a certain direction. And it goes over the same direction like 70 times. So the, the ground-based people that work on the project, they will pick the field of view with their computers and they will analyze that field of view, about one field of view at a time. They'll have the measurements, they'll accumulate from the next scan, you know, a couple of, couple of months later, and they'll, they'll plot it out the measurements and they'll draw the actual parallax motion like that Barnard star example. Mm -hmm. and 70 passes over many years, going on six, seven years now, um, the data, and that's how they do it. There's no real snapshot. It's a constant scan going around all the time, like, a, like, it's like declination zones. You do one declination zone, you rotate around, and you go to the next declination zone, and so on. That's how it's done. So there is it continually refining its measurement then as they get more observations, or is it 76 kind of what they need to uh, get the accuracy that they want? Well, the more scans you do, the, the better the accuracy, but there's a limitation on accuracy due to the instrumentation, the quality of the instrumentation. We all know this with our ground-based uh, amateur telescope. So uh, that's how it works. I think the, uh, the Gaia mission and also the JWST, which was launched in uh, Thanksgiving Day, those two missions are going to revolutionize astronomy all over again, just like the HST, Hubble Space Telescope. And in you know, the next couple of years, we're going to see some fabulous information come out of these, these uh, surveys. Okay, anybody else have a question? Anybody have a question about occultations while well, we've got <laughs> an expert here? I got a question about occultations. Okay. I've, had, 
I've had six misses already this year on attempts, and I've got another four or five planned for the next couple of weeks. So um, how come I keep missing them? <laughs> Actually, the, the Gaia satellite um, has produced positions of such unprecedented position uh, of the asteroid and the star, we can now get predictions on the ground accurate to less than uh, maybe one tenth of a half width. In other words, if we have a path width of say 100 kilometers, the accuracy is give or take five or 10 kilometers, very, very accurate. Compared to 25 years ago, when we used to call these things David Dunn of wild goose chases, um, <laughs> the precision, the, the path ship would jump four or five paths away. So it was, you had to be lucky to catch it 25, 30 years ago. So you, you basically had to spread a lot of people out over the area to hope that some of them would get it. Exactly, exactly. Now, there's a very famous one in Houston uh, about um, almost 20 years ago. And the path was predicted to go right over the west side of Houston. So we had all the Houston Astronomical Society people watching for it. I drove out toward the Grange and I got it. The path shifted out west toward the Grange. I turned out to be right in the center of the path and nobody in Houston got it. And this is kind of a turnoff for people that want to try these. But now we have predictions because of the Gaia satellite data. Um, we've got predictions are pretty much right on. If the path is like, it's gonna be right over here, it's gonna be right over there more, more than likely. Very, very rarely now does it change. And as a result, instead of getting one or 200, one or 200 occultation successes per year worldwide, we're now measuring over a thousand occultations per year. Wow. In fact, 2021, uh, Dave Harrell told us we had 1300 occultation measurements. Uh, uh, successful measurements in 2021. And uh, so we're really making leaps and bounds, increase, increases with the uh, Gaia satellite data. And yeah, we kind of got the same message from, we had a couple of guys talking about uh, the, uh, the the variable star group, uh, AV, a, AVSO, uh, that uh, they're just having leaps and bounds in the amount of data that they're collecting on variable stars because of, you know, the, the improvements in technology and, and what, uh, uh, the astrophotography related equipment has gotten so good. So. Yeah, actually, in, in, including, uh, I also measure double stars and mm -hmm. uh, Gaia satellite has been extremely, extremely useful in determining which are real optical doubles or real binary stars because we now know distances. And in order to have a real binary star, as opposed to a chance optical alignment, um, the Gaia satellite is really, really helping on that. So we're able to identify more true binary systems and versus the ones that are just chance alignments, you know, optically aligned, like M40 in the Messier catalog, the double star M40, that's mm -hmm. a chance optical alignment. It's not a real binary system. Now, well, you were telling me earlier that uh, the, the Gaia data has kind of shown that a lot of stars we thought or, thought were double really aren't. That I, it was a pretty impressive percentage of them too that have been uh, reclassified. So. Exactly, exactly. In fact, the Washington Double Star Catalog, which has over 150,000 entries, it's updated like two or three times a month by uh, the guys at the U.S. Naval Observatory, Brian Mason. And a lot of these are just optical doubles. And I wrote them, and I, I put out a paper, as I mentioned, I put out a paper which came out early, earlier this month. I suggested they change this catalog. Well, suggested. I said perhaps they should change the catalog into two catalogs or more catalogs, one with real binaries and one with others that are just there for historical purposes, which we now know are optical doubles. Mm. So I gotta be careful when you make those suggestions. <laughs> <laughs> can imagine. Because I'm uh, just a teacher, you know, I'm not a professional. So Richard, I've got a, I've got a question for you on the, the occultation, uh, as far as equipment is concerned. Uh, well, first of all, for, uh, for the, the telescope itself, uh, how accurate of a tracking system do you have to use? Do you, do you need to have in order to do occultations? Your tracking system does not have to be terribly accurate uh, as long as you can see the object and uh, in the field of view during the occultation. And these have to be done on video. Uh, we're doing one video now. We don't mm -hmm. do it live on visual observations. Uh, there are many, many of us uh, that have a set of multiple stations, remote stations, that are fixed, there's no motor drive. And they're pointed in such a way so that the occulted star will pass in the field of view at the time of the occultation. And this takes a lot of time to set up and calibrate. So, mm -hmm. uh, so the, you'll see a star just kind of move in slowly across the field of view, then the occultation occurs. And then by the time you go pick it up later, like half hour, an hour later, 
the stars out of the field of view, but it's set up ahead of time to catch the star. Okay. So they, they pre-park multiple rigs at the area they need to see it. Exactly. We call it pre-point, pre-pointing. Yeah. You point toward the air of the sky that the earth will rotate the star and the target star in the time of the occultation. You could be like five degrees away because you might, if you, it depends on how, how you want to plan this and how good you are. And I, I did this in the very beginning. I had several multiple stations and they all worked, but I never got a hit because the predictions weren't that good. <laughs> but yeah. the, um, And how large of a field of view are you looking at when you do that? Typical multiple stations will have a field of view of, uh, I'd say about two degrees. Okay. One or two okay. degrees. I think we talked to the club a couple of years ago on this, and uh, I can do it again, uh, updating it. Uh, but uh, we use a, a lot of people use these. Um, take you take a pair of binoculars and you just split them up, and, and you've got a telescope. And the binocular field of view, along with your your video camera, can produce a field of view of like you know one or two degrees. Okay. More than the size of the moon, so at least plenty of room for error for the pre-pointing. So, all right. Okay. And and how do you uh, uh, how do you location timestamp the data stream? You still use a kiwi, or uh, my understanding was that those were were no longer being made. Yeah, the kiwi is no longer being made. That's a time inserter. For those of you that don't know what it is, it it overlays the GPS time right on the video. IOTA now has uh, the IOTA VTI, which we manufacture ourselves. Well, through a company, and uh, it's about three hundred bucks, and uh, it'll overlay the video right on your uh, your recorder from the GPS satellite. So it goes in between the camera and the, your digital video recorder, and um, they're beautiful units. They're they're great, and we can get timings accurate to uh, several ten thousands of a second. Wow. It's more than the video frame rate of thirty frames a second. So it's really nice to have GPS time inserted video to make the measurements of occultations. I see. On the, anything on the stellar distances? My first slide, as you recall, um, let me go back to it here. I didn't have a big enough uh, ruler, so I used this tape measure to get to the first galaxy over here. Well, that's it. Okay. Yeah. We appreciate the talk, Richard. It was fascinating. Yeah. It's very interesting. Thank you very much. I welcome the opportunity. I always, always like meeting with you guys and hanging around astronomers. That's one of my favorite things for me to do. All right. Okay. Uh, that, that concludes the program for tonight, guys. Uh, we're kind of down about half, uh, half strength right now. Anybody have any final questions not necessarily for Richard but for anything that we covered tonight or if anybody needs to stay on for a few minutes to talk about something I can do that uh, otherwise I uh, uh, appreciate your attendance uh, and we'll, uh, we'll see you again on the next uh, month okay gotta stop the Live stream. Okay, appreciate the comments.